let's talk about some clinical notes, some diseases, some drugs, some things like that um, about muscle contraction. So um, first off, um, rigor mortis. Uh, rigor mortis is the sustained muscle contraction occur that occurs after death. And it's directly related to the stories that we've been telling about how muscle contraction occurs. So the problem with being dead, among other things, is that there is no ATP being made after death, primarily because no oxygen is being delivered. So remember that in order to release the um, myosin head from the actin active site, you actually have to have ATP bind, hold on, ATP bind for the release, right? So when you run out of ATP, which won't be too long after death, um, what will happen is um, the myosin heads that were there, um, and remember they sort of form passively, the cross bridges form passively, but you need um, ATP to release them. The myosin heads that form will not get detached eventually. In addition, um, the calcium um, over time will start to leak into the sarcoplasm from the extracellular fluid down its electrochemical gradient. It will also start to leak out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, so you'll start to build up more calcium than you had when you were alive. In addition, the calcium that is there cannot get pumped back into the SR because you no know, ATP eventually. So what will happen is eventually you're gonna have sustained muscle contraction. You'll be stiff as a board. This is a picture of rigor. Um, and it's temperature dependent, but generally speaking, it will build up. And then as your proteins start to denature, usually 12 to 15 hours after death, cells will begin to decompose and the proteins will begin to denature and the myosin heads will let go of the actin active sites. Um, now, this is totally temperature dependent because all of this will happen much more quickly at higher temperatures and much more slowly at lower temperatures. So rigor um, determining how long a person has been dead via the degree of rigor has to do with the temperature as well. Okay, so now our first communicable disease that is related to muscle is polio, poliomyelitis. Um, it is uh, an in infectious and really communicable disease, uh, a virus that actually infects and destroys motor neurons. And since it infects and destroys motor neurons, what you will lose is the ability to do this. You will not be able to stimulate the muscle to contraction. And generally speaking, most neurons are amitotic, so when this occurs, it becomes permanent. So polio was... Um, all over the world um, and people, since the diaphragm is skeletal muscle and you need to change pressure to get air to move in and out of the respiratory system. Sometimes people were in iron lungs because of the paralysis of the diaphragm. There was lots of limb paralysis associated with polio. And then um, a vaccine was developed and was not used for profit and was generously uh, disseminated throughout the world. And now wild polio um, is mostly eradicated, not completely eradicated in the world. It still pops up in a couple of little places. But um, there was a really, really effective vaccination campaign. Um, and polio is has got some historical significance for the entire world, but also for the United States, because one of our presidents actually was partially paralyzed because of pol polio. Um, it was um, not Teddy Roosevelt, but Franklin, uh, FDR. Um, and again, this dude, I think, is so, I just think he would be fantastic to hang out with. This is polio vaccinate and 0.0. .0. Now that's funny. Um, okay. Um, cramps, not really a disorder, but it's related to this. Um, when action potentials fire faster than normal on motor neurons, then they will cause more contraction than they intended to do. Um, this is often due to an ion imbalance. It could be sodium, it could be calcium, it could be potassium, and it causes involuntary tetanic contractions. And sometimes if you'll eat a banana, drink a glass of milk, you won't know why it went away, but it will. Okay, so muscular dystrophy is next. Muscular dystrophy, most forms of muscular dystrophy 
or X-linked recessive. Um, it's a genetic disease. Um, most of the time, it is a mutation on the X chromosome. And since, of course, um, females have two X chromosomes, um, you are probably not going to manifest muscular dystrophy, but males will manifest everything on their X chromosome. So it causes a progressive degeneration of skeletal and cardiac muscle fibers um, because there's a weakness in the cytoskeletal protein. And as you're pulling on them to make them contract, it will start to break down the cytoskeletal protein. And um, a lot of times these little boys are not diagnosed until they're like in their toddler years. And sometimes they have strange pull up and gait patterns and a pediatrician would be looking for that. And then it progressively um, degenerates your skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle. And sometimes the kids don't live to adulthood and sometimes they do. Um, there's some treatments that you can do right now, some genetic therapies that they can do right now. But exercise definitely does not help the situation. And again, it seems to be an, area, uh, an error in a cytoskeletal protein, and it's more common in uh, males than females. Okay, and um, that is genetic. Um, myasthenia gravis is next, and this is an autoimmune disease. And what happens with this autoimmune disease is you got infected with something, don't know what, and the antibody that you made to whatever the thing was ends up um, destroying your motor end plates or destroying your ability to stimulate your motor end plates. And so you can't depolarize. And what you end up getting is you get what's called flaccid paralysis. A lot of times it occurs in the face and you get the drooping of the eyelids, but it's an autoimmune disease and you can go into remission and then it can show up in the arms or the legs. It can change your voice, cause swallowing difficulty. And like all autoimmune diseases, there really isn't a cure, but people can go into remission with myasthenia gravis. Basically your acetylcholine receptors just completely stop working. Um, and okay, so next is tetanus. So um, tetanus is um, a pathogen. And with the pathogen, what occurs, it's, it's a, a bacterium called Clostridium tetani. It's a very common ubiquitous soil bacterium. And when you get this soil bacterium in anaerobic conditions, it produces a toxin. So a wound that is deep and closes on itself could potentially have the pathogen and then close on itself so there's no oxygen. Those are the types of wounds that increase the likelihood of tetanus. Now, your mom told you you get tetanus by stepping on a rusty nail. It doesn't have to be a nail, it doesn't have to be rusty. But that deep wound is more likely to cause tetanus um, and it produces a neurotoxin. Now the deal is once it produces the neurotoxin, um, for instance, killing off the pathogen doesn't particularly help because the toxin is circulating in your bloodstream. So you actually have to have the antitoxin or you could choose to vaccinate. And so this is a picture of the muscular contraction that occurs with tetanus and sometimes it's called lockjaw. So it's the opposite of myasthenia gravis. That produces a flaccid paralysis in which you can't contract the muscle and this produces what we call a spastic paralysis. And it's pretty quickly deadly um, unless intervention occurs. This is another spastic paralysis with a child. This is something that you can easily vaccinate against. You do need booster vaccines every once in a while. And since you guys are going into healthcare, you will be vaccinated against tetanus. Okay. Botulism, same genus, different species of uh, kind of a pathogen, I guess. It's a bacterium. This is what's often contracted from improperly canned foods. So um, same kind of story. The bacterium um, is relatively common and when it gets into anaerobic conditions, it produces a toxin as well as a neurotoxin. And what happens is this actually causes flaccid paralysis. And when um, you take in the Clostridium botulinum, usually indicated by, um, so when you are home canning foods, you're supposed to boil, boil the heck out of the lid and boil the heck out of the jar before you actually create a vacuum. If you skipped a couple steps or you weren't paying attention to what you did, then the bacterium could still be living when you create the path, when you create the vacuum. And then, 
indication of a living bacterium might be that a little extra carbon dioxide was produced in the can or the jar. And so you get the dimple popping up on the top of the can or the jar that's malformed. And when you open it, it hisses at you, shouldn't hiss at you. Um, that is an indication, not necessarily that Clostridium botulinum is in there, but something is in there and was still alive. Now, um, when this gets going, it goes relatively quick. And what it does is it prevents the release of acetylcholine and causes para uh, flaccid paralysis. Usually hits the face first. You'll get double vision and blurred eyelids, droop or dro blurred vision, drooping eyelids, and then it kind of moves out from there. Um, this is also the basis of Botox cosmetic. So when you have someone who's trained to do so, they can inject botulinum toxin, not the pathogen, just the toxin, in a local area, and it will eventually destroy the ability of the muscle to contract in that area. And actually what happens is the axon terminals eventually will go away, and then four months later, they'll come back. So you want this to be done by a medical professional if you're going to use um, Botox cosmetic. And then the last two things are just a couple of poisons that we have developed because we like to do things like that as humans. One of them is called curare. And um, I read about this one in Agatha Christie novels when I was a kid. Um, what curare does is it is um, a South American derivative, I think Amazon area. I'm terrible at geography, but um, South American derivative from plant, okay? And um, it was used in blow darts and arrows and those kinds of things. And what it does is it blocks the receptors on the sarcolemma. So it blocks the acetylcholine receptors. And since it blocks the receptors on the sarcolemma, you don't get any depolarization. And then um, it will cause asphyxiation because of paralysis of the diaphragm. So if you were trying to eat a monkey out of the tree and you want to climb the tree, um, thunk and then wait for the monkey to fall out of the tree, and then you can eat the monkey, especially since this doesn't have a very long half-life. So, of course, people have used it to kill each other as well. Um, and then the last um, chemical is um, some nerve gases, some of these that the United States developed first, including sarin gas. I don't know if you've heard about sarin gas. And also some pesticides. They weren't designed to do this to humans, but to pests. What they actually do is they actually inhibit acetylcholine esterase. So acetylcholine can't get out of the synapse. And when acetylcholine can't get out of the synapse, instead of this muscle not being able to contract, it can't relax. So whereas curare would kill you because your diaphragm could not contract and therefore you couldn't inhale, sarin gas would kill you because you inhaled and you couldn't relax and couldn't exhale. Okay, that's it, it for the clinical connections.